Hello, and welcome to Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast. This is a show about how artists use technology to tell their stories, and I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. We have a really special episode today focusing entirely on the picture editorial process at Pixar Animation Studios. This is all outlined in an incredible new book by Bill Kender and Bobby Osteen called Making the Cut at Pixar, The Art of Editing Animation. So I have a confession to make. I have spent almost my entire career in post-production for feature films, and I had almost no idea what was involved in editing picture for animation, especially at Pixar. And the work that has gone into the development of this sort of unique editorial process there. I even made a joke one time when a friend of mine got hired to be a picture editor at Pixar, a really lame joke. In fact, I think I asked him, so what does that mean? You just cut the heads and tails off the shots and drop them into the timeline. So that's how naive and uninformed I was. So if you're like me, you're going to learn a lot from this episode. So to help illustrate just how instrumental and important the editor is in the creative process of all Pixar films. We have put together a really all-star team of conversations with the authors of the book, Bill Kinder and Bobby Osteen. And we'll be joined in conversation by Pixar's chief creative officer and director of so many of their films, Pete Docter. Also, we'll be joined by longtime legendary editor and director himself, Lee Unkridge, along with picture editors, Kevin Nolting and Edie Ichioka, whom I will introduce separately as we go through the conversation. But before I get ahead of myself, I'd like to start with Bill Kinder on how this book was conceived and how it came together. For those of you who might not know Bill, he worked for 18 years at Pixar in the editorial department on so many films from Bugs Life to Monsters University. So he really knows what he's talking about. And he had an interesting journey himself from being a young editor working in live action to his work at Pixar and then to this book. Here's Bill. I've always been drawn to editing from the time that I was a, a Super 8 brat in the 70s. You know, I learned that the pair of scissors was the thing. And that idea of one plus one can equal three was like, wow, okay. And just as a film student and in my first jobs in television and and later in film, I was always finding myself uh, in my favorite place of the cutting room. And, uh, you know, I feel that's really where, where films are made. And so when I was at Zoetrope, American Zoetrope, my first exposure to story reel editing was there. Oddly enough, Francis Coppola hired a bunch of uh, Disney story artists to board his version of Pinocchio back in the 90s. So it was going to be a hybrid. Uh, he was very visionary, right? And had this idea of, of making a hybrid animated Pinocchio with live action mixed in. And we storyboarded the entire thing. Uh, and that was my first exposure to the process. And my role there, in, in addition to doing some of the editing, was to bring his electronic storyboarding notion into the digital era. And these were early, early days. So when Pixar called uh, a year later, we had something to talk about. They had been trying to solve these same problems on Toy Story. And we were probably the only two places just a few miles apart from each other in the Bay Area trying to uh, understand this. And that's what led to my 18 year journey at Pixar, working with all the great editors there and realizing this is really where it happens. This is the cornerstone of these things. And realizing that no one in the industry, film students, the world doesn't really understand this and it became my mission to try to explain it and so you know now we have a book that tries to do that so bill i would love for you to just give us an overview like well just the idea behind this book what is a picture editor at pixar doing and i love this this metaphor that you've hit on which is like the the center of the wheel with the spokes if you can speak to that you know when we think of an editorial pipeline uh, we think of a line where the editor is, you know, at, at the end of something. We, we shoot and we deliver and the editor makes choices and then, and then we're done. But of course, in animation, it's not like that. And so the first thing I try to do in setting this up for people is to just get a, a geometry shift, a paradigm shift in that image 
you can Google film editing pipeline and you'll get a line. Some of them go top to bottom, but they're lines. Don't think of it, you know, don't think of it that way. Think of it as a circle. Think of it as a wheel and the editor is in the middle of the wheel. And coming out of this wheel are all the shot-based spokes as the film develops. You, you start with storyboards and putting those together is, is an enormous, maybe the largest task involved. But then comes camera and layout. And now you have shots that need to conform somehow to the earlier ideas that you had when it was a story reel or an animatic. Uh, then you have uh, animation and you have performance then you have uh, effects, then you have lighting, you know, and it gets more and more refined each turn of the wheel, certainly, but it goes around and around and it iterates and the editor has to handle all of these things and do what editors do in live action too, which is pay attention to the microscopic and the, the performance detail, uh, but also say, wait, you know, that's a funny bit, but this scene doesn't need that. We're going somewhere else and hold the whole scene and the whole film in mind too, and be the guardian of that emotional purpose. But before Bill came to find himself at Pixar, in those early days after the company was founded, Pete Docter was among the original creative group that became known as the Brain Trust. At that point in time, there was a lot that that group didn't know about the process of putting a full feature film together and also about editing. And as it turns out, that probably was an advantage to them. I was interested in those early days and how that blank slate became such incredibly fertile creative ground for the folks at Pixar. So I posed that question to Pete Docter, who has won Academy Awards for his direction of Up, Inside Out, and Soul. I, I would love for you to just kind of take us back to some of the early days. Uh, I know that you were part of the original you know, creative group at, at Pixar, uh, working on Toy Story, that, that group that kind of became known as the, as the brain trust. And it was, you guys were like writers and directors and filmmakers. And then you also had Lee Unkridge there who was a picture editor. So yeah. can you talk a little bit about like those early days at Pixar, how that, how that working methodology came together and why was it important for Lee and picture editing to be part of that process? Yeah, Lee was really the first one to educate me uh, of the power, the real power of an editor, you know, because if you go back in in time through animation, like all during Walt's life, there were no real editors. There were cutters and the directors were the ones who did the selecting of takes and the timing. And I remember John Lasseter sitting, having studied that system and, and working at Disney, you know, he thought that that was what he needed to do. So he was sitting there listening to thousands of takes from Tom Hanks and all this and and trying to time things out with a stopwatch, you know, that's the way things used to be. You'd write it all down and be like, this is 47 frames long, and then I should cut to this this board for three feet, seven frames, whatever. Lee kind of took all that on. And um, the thing that struck me was, man, I don't know how many times we would see the same material, exact same takes, same picture stuff put together, and you'd be like, we're gonna have to rewrite this. This is awful. It doesn't work at all. And then Lee would take it and you're, and suddenly it'd be like, oh, wow, that, that actually works great. So the same stuff could be put together in magical ways that would sometimes just work and communicate and be entertaining and funny or emotional. And then other times uh, not. So uh, that, that's the power of editing. <laughs> Next, we spoke with Lee Unkrich about how he became a part of the brain trust and how he found himself at Pixar creating something in a, a paradigm shift in how the company looked at the role of the film editor and why it was important for that role to be a key member of the creative team from the very inception of the film all the way through the entire filmmaking process. And of course, if you know anything about Pixar, you know that Lee himself has won two Academy Awards for directing Toy Story 3 and also for directing Coco. I hit it off with with uh, the folks really quickly. I mean, just from a creative standpoint, we were really humming. I I always hesitate to compare us to the Beatles because we're not the Beatles, but it's similar in that this very particular group of guys with their own skills found each other in this world and created great things, created, created great music in their case. And the same thing kind of happened with us. You know, we all kind of came to the table with different skill sets, but together we were able to make something that transcended all of us individually. 
Um, and I just kind of slip streamed into that. I mean, we didn't call it the brain trust at the beginning. Uh, I don't even know that we ever named it that. I think it somebody at probably some journalist at some point called it that. And later on, when it wasn't John directing every movie and, and, you know, Pete started directing and Andrew started directing, we found that, uh, it was lonely to be off solving problems on your own. And so we kind of, uh, institutionalized a way for us to regularly come together and, and, keep tabs on each other's work and be there, you know, with help and guidance and to help solve the myriad problems that come up. Um, interestingly, I did come to Pixar as an editor, but I wanted to be a director. I mean, that's what I was, I, I loved editing in film school. I found that that was really kind of my a primary love, but, you know, I, I was directing there as well and I directed a little television. So when I came to Pixar, I really, I had skills beyond just editing. And they proved to be really helpful because, um, you know, none of them had any experience in live action at the time. And uh, their whole frame of reference was animation. And when I got to the studio, I kind of recognized that what they were doing was more akin to, not more akin to, but it was, it was as much like live action as it was animation. And it seemed to me that we needed to be bound by the the, the quote unquote rules of of, uh, of live action filmmaking. So um, John really handed me the reins when it came to uh, all of the camera work and staging uh, and the cutting. Um, so I, really, from the very beginning, I was already tasked with. I was given responsibilities that were beyond what an editor would traditionally be given. Um, and then that just continued to grow over time. The process at Pixar was a little bit more like live action than traditional cell animation. And, and I'm wondering, is that is that more or less because after you've gone through the storyboard phase and you've got, you know, some rough durations, then you're then you're actually working with a virtual camera in a virtual environment. And then you can make decisions about coverage about, you know, camera movements, about focal lengths on lenses and that sort of thing. So is that what you mean when sort of you, you brought a live action mentality to it? Yeah, pretty much because, uh, well, when I, when I first got the job, I started watching a bunch of animation to see what I could learn from it. And what I noticed right away is that a lot of it was staged in a very flat manner. Uh, not a lot of depth, although there was stuff done with multiplane cameras, of course, in Disney films that, that gave that illusion of depth. But, at Pixar, once I understand how the sausage was made, I saw that, you know, we, we essentially had these little virtual sets and virtual characters and, and cameras and, uh, and it, it just didn't feel that much different from, from doing live action. And since that was my training and my sensibility, um, I, I kind of pushed things in that direction. Um, and like, and everybody was on board and they wanted the film to feel very cinematic. And, and I, you know, I was learning from them, they were learning from me and, and we were all kind of coming up in this together. Um, that said, things on the first Toy Story were still pretty crude. Uh, when you talk about coverage, we didn't really do coverage. I had to, I almost had to kind of cut the movie in my mind. And then we produced those images, those shots. And it wasn't until later, it wasn't until A Bug's Life that we started truly creating coverage and, and then bringing all of that coverage into the cutting room and, and working with it and shaping it um, in the way that you would traditionally. My sense is that part of it was you guys were creating a new form in computer animation that allowed you to kind of break the rules maybe that you were talking about that, um, that John had kind of inherited from the old traditional hand-drawn animation. So what was it about working in the computer and having computer animation that allowed Lee to kind of break open this process and think about editing in a different and new way? Well, up to that time, it was all on film, right? Everything was done uh, analog. And uh, I, I, I don't think it was Lee. It was somebody here who decided, hey, we've heard of this thing, non-linear editing. Well, actually, it goes way back to George Lucas. That was one of his mandates of trying to do Edidroid. And so John and everybody had seen that. Um, so when Avid came around, we said, hey, we want to cut this digitally. And we told Disney and they said, no, no, no. Uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg, who is the head of Disney Animation, won't watch anything that's not on film. Now, I don't know if that was a mis miscommunication or if he literally felt that way or what, but they were pretty strong for a while that we would have to cut everything in the traditional manner Pixar decided, I don't know who, uh, who had the authority to say this, but they said, well, we're, we're not going to listen to that. We're going to do it anyway. And Lee came on really because all, all the editors we had worked with up to that time were unfamiliar 
with the technology. They knew the old fashioned, you know, uh, cutting film and marking and all that stuff. And so Lee was the first guy who just was, uh, had this, it was, it was amazing watching him work even back then. It was like an extension of his arm. It's just like, you know, he would, he was so fast. And it also made us realize, oh my gosh, this is uh, an amazing tool. The same way that the animation worked. All right. Just think, just to think about this. Like if you draw a line on paper, you can erase it, but it's a lot of work. And then once you erase it, it's gone. You have to draw it again. If you sit on a computer, you just said undo, redo, undo, redo. So you can really explore and experiment a lot uh, in animation. And editing was the same way. We, we could suddenly try stuff out. It could be dangerous, you know, because as soon as you open that box and try things, uh, you can spend a lot of time. Whereas if you don't have that ability, you have to, you have to commit, you know. So we try to balance that. But it, it was a great um, new tool for us. On, on Toy Story and ever since. Pete, you've had such a, I, I think, a huge impact on the conceptualization process at, at Pixar. And I know that you even have a part of the process is named after you. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> so tell us about, we, we, we've, we've been talking about storyboarding, but tell us about this whole thing of the pitch doctor and how that kind of fits into the process and what that looks like. Uh, there was this guy, when I first started at Pixar in 1990, there was this guy named Flip Phillips who had, some early Apple tool that he was able to time out boards, right? You could type in, I want this on for 17 frames or 43 or whatever it is. And I thought, oh man, there's so many artists here, like Jeff Pigeon, he would pitch his boards and his timing in his pitch was so great. I was like, what if you could record somehow his timing? Maybe I just thought like through a space bar, he could time out, he could pitch his boards and it would be a great head start to the editor was my thought. Um, as it turned out, it we don't really use that part of it very much. But again, kind of going back in history, the way like Walt Disney would approve sequences was off of a pitch. So the storyboard artist would pin up like a comic book version of the movie behind him, and they'd sit with a stick and they would say, and then the guy walks over here and he goes, "Look out!" And then, nah, nah, you know, so they'd kind of act out the parts and provide sound effects. And based off of that pitch, Disney would say, "All right, move it downstairs, put it into production." Um, what we found out was that a lot of times the great pitch artists like Joe Ramft or Bob Peterson could make you laugh hysterically, but you weren't sure if you were laughing at the material or their performance. And so pitch doctor, though there's a sort of a loss there, um, for that, the, the enjoyment of that pitch, I think it is more accurate to what you're actually going to see and experience in watching the film. Cause it really approximates that same thing. You're watching a screen one image is coming up at a time. And um, that was what I think Pitch Doctor allowed us to do, as well as, of course, make tons of changes and uh, adjustments in ways that weren't possible or would have been very difficult the old analog way. Since this creative process was kind of new and unique to Pixar, I asked Bill Kinder how they approached going from the pitch to the boards and then into production. I'm really intrigued by this, this move from storyboards, what other people might call animatics, which is basically just still shots kind of timed out to give a sense of rhythm and, and whatnot. And then you move into layout, which is kind of rough 3d environments with kind of stick figures that, that are moved in position in that. But then, then you start to make decisions about like camera, you know, virtual camera angle, what virtual lenses to use. And so I'm kind of curious, like, can you just use that as a specific case study of like, what's, what's the editor doing in that transition? You know, my example to point people to is the before and after. Uh, if you look at Pixar short films before they had an editor, all, all of the ones before Toy Story had, had no editor, really. They had someone assembling things. Um, they're very classic proscenium 2D animation. Think of Knick Knack. You're, you're on a shelf. Um, think of Luxo. It's, it's a one single static shot. Um, and what happened when an editor arrived, someone, and I mean someone who had an understanding of film grammar, film history, uh, had directed live action film. This is Lee Unkrich, of course, on Toy Story, showed up and, and he arrived. He talks about this in the book. He says, you know, okay, I'd never done animation. I, I'm going to study the classics and understand what's happening here. And then he realizes they got into layout. Wait a minute. 
we can throw all that out. This is a different ball game. We have cameras and, and I know live action. I know what you can do with a camera. There's a whole set of choices that we are going to be able to make to support our story. Whereas with Disney and cell animation and kind of the classic tradition, uh, they, they had moves, they had, they had tricks, if you will, to create 3D illusion. A lot of it was painterly. And, and of course, the multiplane was like, wow, you know, to, to create this moving through space thing. But if you think about that, you don't see a uh, shot reverse shot in, uh, you know, classic Disney animation. That's just not the way the grammar really worked. Whereas if you watch Toy Story, and that was, that was my memory when I first saw that film was it felt like a movie. And, and I think that difference, that turning point has to do with the editor saying, wait, we can create shots here. There's a certain language we can use. We're not stuck with the storyboards. The storyboards are telling us a lot about character and performance and plot and clarity. But now we can up the whole game with what we know about the language of, of camera. Our story reels, which a lot of people call animatics, is really an extension of the script process for us. So we're not pre-vising. We're not really mocking up. We want this exact shot or overs or, you know, we're not taking it too literally. We're more using it as, does this scene work? Do the characters communicate clearly? Uh, do we feel the sparks of entertainment there? So it's we, we stay in boards for quite a while. Even back then, I think um, it was less extensive on Toy Story. We were we were trying to get into animation very quickly. Um, but uh, our first two or three passes would be all drawings, hand drawn on pieces of paper with little stickers to keep track of them in the corner. Uh, like I say, down shooter under a uh, camera, and then Lee would cut it together. Usually with, I think we always used uh, temporary dialogue and sound effects. So we would just like, I was Buzz and Andrew Stanton was Woody. And we did the first couple passes that way so that we could kind of at least have some confidence that what we had wasn't absolute garbage before we went to Tom Hanks and Tim Allen to record them. So, yeah, the whole thing was kind of like as much as we could fooling ourselves into, well, not fooling, I guess I was going to say the whole thing was as much as we could trying to mock up what the experience of watching the actual movie was going to be like to the point where we'd even put the little logo at the top, you know, the castle and stuff so that you kind of settle into the theater and you're like, okay, this is a real movie. And then bad drawings would come on screen, but you could still kind of get the general flow of, do I like this character? Am I intrigued by what happens? Am I confused? All that stuff. I want to take a moment here to introduce the co-author of the book, Bobby Osteen, who writes about editing and the editor's process and how that process sometimes complicated things when working on Pixar films. From her perspective and a lot of our interview subjects, it was the editor, not just the director, who was charged with overseeing the creative vision of the story, even if that sometimes meant making some unpopular picture changes in service to that story. What's so interesting and so challenging for the editor is that when they're dealing with storyboards, they're dealing with no real geography. So that how many boards does it take to get across a room? has nothing to do with actual sets. So everything gets longer as they go through every stage. So once they're dealing with a real set, characters moving through space, they have to readjust the, 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 the cutting, the, the patterns and, the, and, the, and there's coverage. It's a whole different animal. And then when you get to animation, animation becomes very expensive. It's very, very few changes, but say the animators are basically actors. So they say, they say, let's have this character sniff a flower and, 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 oh, isn't that adorable? And then the editor will say, well, wait a minute. I want, you know, I want to work with you on this, but this, we have this certain built in tension or character arc or story arc that has to be told in this scene. And you have to keep the integrity of that and if you sniff the flower, you lose the tension. So in itself, it's cute. But the editor, as Bill was saying, we love this word, Bill and I, the guardian of the story. And they have to always babysit and kind of be the guardian of, let's remember what we're telling here. So 
as all these dramatic changes are taking place, the editor has to, and their reputation is sometimes being the entertainment killer because they had, the rubber hits the wheel and we're telling a story and we can't lose our audience, you know, and that's a, that's a really huge responsibility for the editor. Kevin Nolting is a longtime collaborator of Pete Doctors, having been the picture editor on Up, Inside Out, and Soul, among other Pixar projects. And I wanted to know how that creative partnership worked for Pete. When I first started working with Kevin, it was, it's, I think the relationship started, well, not, not with suspicion, but limited, like, right? But I felt like, okay, I know what editors do. He's going to come in once we have story material, and he's going to cut it together. And, and like Lee, it'll either work or not. But I kind of soon realized, oh, this guy has ideas about filmmaking. This guy knows storytelling, you know, not just the cutting of stuff, but he understands uh, how little we can get away with. You know, there's that old saying, I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long one, you know. And usually our stuff starts way long um, and half of it you don't need in the movie at all. And Kevin's always very ruthless about like, I don't think we need any of this. We can cut this or, you know, maybe the thing I'm missing you're telling me this, you know, this information about a character. I don't have enough context to understand why that's important. You know, so he'll poke a lot of stuff. So on Soul, he was one of the first guys that we brought on um, to really help craft the storytelling. And I think that then allowed Kevin to have a lot of information and therefore a lot of um, effect on the story, the pacing, not just the pacing and the and the entertainment of it, but also just the crafting of the telling. Here's Kevin Nolting on that relationship in his own words. Some of the directors at Pixar are very script based. They love to have a full script before they start and they use the script in sort of a traditional way, like in live action. Pete's never been comfortable with that. And he admits himself that he doesn't read scripts well and he doesn't. So he, for him, it's more of an on, it's sort of a free flowing process. And I just embrace I, the same way. I just embrace that. So I think we both like to be fairly flexible and don't, I don't know, I don't even know how to describe it, but we're not, we're just more, um, we just like working in that more free flowing way and discovering things as we work. He got to the point where some directors, the more script based directors will keep things in the story department a long time. They'll have the story artists keep redrawing the scene until they think they have it right before they send it to editorial. Very early on, by the time of Inside Out, Pete would see one pass in the story and say, just get it to edit. I want to see it up on the screen. I can't, I don't, you know, I can't react to it this way. So he's just like me. He just likes to react to the movie that we're seeing on the screen. In my conversation with Bill, he he had this great phrase that he used sometimes about the editors at Pixar being entertainment killers. Um, and so uh, it's a provocative statement. So I, I would love for you to just kind of uh, uh, riff on what that means and kind of the role of the editor and being maybe a bit of a reality check as as story is coming together. Yeah, I think I see. Yeah. I mean, animation is meant to be fun and, you know, a lot of entertainment, but you do have to have a story that holds together and a, you know, performance arc. And yeah. so we're often seeing like in my case, that's what I concentrate on first, because I know Pixar has so many funny people, people who can just add so much entertainment to a movie once it's a movie. And so I'm always careful about going off on tangents that are just solely entertainment based that sort of step, get in the way of seeing what the movie should be first. That's just my personal take on it. And so, yeah, we get this reputation for being entertainment killers. You know, it's not that we're against it. It's that we want to have a good base first. Let's put it that way. There's also something I find interesting about, you know, sometimes, you know, jokes or things that work in live action. I'm sure, you, as you well know, there are sometimes jokes and bits of business that work great on the page, but then they may have even worked great on the set and in the dailies, but you put them in the cut mm -hmm. and suddenly it doesn't. And I'm kind of curious, like, is there, is, does something similar happen in animation? Yeah, because context, what you see on the screen is really all you have. And nobody can see that until they see it. So especially in live action, they're on the set. I worked on a Zucker Brothers movie and 
they would just dailies, they would just be laughing hilariously and just, and we'd cut this stuff together and nobody would laugh, you know, and that's just the nature of the beast. <laughs> you never know what you have till it's up on the screen. So the advantage we have at Pixar is we can see it on the screen before we commit to it. So by the time you get to animation, you've given them, you know, a good base of jokes. Now, the, for us, sometimes the problem comes in, people still want to add humor to that. But if it's out of context and it doesn't really fit with the story, that's where the discussion sort of begins is, do we want to do that or not? Edie Ichioka was the picture editor on Toy Story 2 and has her own insights into Pixar's unique creative process. You know, I would love to get your kind of overview about, you know, why that is not the way that picture editing works at Pixar and what's what's exciting about editing movies at Pixar for you. Well, you know, one of the most important lessons that I learned at Pixar was to always plus. You're not a tube uh, by which things pass through. In editorial, you anything you touch, you must improve or try to, you know, challenge in some way, stress test it. And, you know, every piece of dialogue that comes through, don't accept it. Think, oh, how can I make this better? What if I take this syllable from this read and this syllable from this read? And it, does that make a more intense sentence? Um, what about the pace of this? You know, should I start, you know, condensing this, uh, this beat to have more of a dramatic feel? Um, so you're always plussing everything, challenging everything, thinking about the camera angles you're delivered because in the digital realm, you can move a camera after something's animated. If you move it too much, you'll probably break the animation, but you know, you can widen out, you can change the angle, you can, um, make different suggestions about, you know, different ways to approach things that even seem locked, but they're not because it's not live action. It's still plastic. I'm curious to hear you talk a little bit about um, sound and sound editing for animation. Not a lot of people outside the industry are necessarily aware of is that, you know, when you're working with animation, of course, you don't have the benefit of production tracks to have any kind of incidental sound. So a lot of that falls onto you as the, as the picture editor to kind of fill that out. What, what do you feel is your responsibility just to get the thing up on its feet in terms of sound? Well, you know, if you want to get it up on its feet, but you want a certain level of polish and you want to cut the material um, as close to what you're going to wind up with as possible. But then you pass it over to someone like Michael Silvers, who does subframe editing and finesses everything, finds the perfect syllable here and just sort of uses the dental tools and gets in there and just make sure there is no gingivitis left. You know, and, you know, the incredibly talented dialogue editors over there really do an amazing job. There are so many that, you know, I mean, Ren Kleiss, who mixes Pixar films over there now, incredibly talented. What I found, one of the th many things about sound that I found fascinating was and, um, vocalizations. They have this, like, they have a library of nose size. Like, what's a nose size? Like, they need nose size, you know? <laughs> like, these little things that you we take for granted when you have actual people, on actors on a set interacting, and you're not, you're not dealing, rarely do they interact. I mean, rarely do they record together. So you have that. But you also just don't have all this very subtle sort of landscape of sound that the editor is creating with along with sound designers and various people. But um, the other thing is that sound is not tight because of the digital tools that were available to the editor at these early stages. Sound is not tied to picture. So the freedom and responsibility of, of piecing together even phonemes, you could, you could manufacture a brilliant performance from multiple takes and no one will ever know. So that the dialogue editing, when Bill and I were writing the book, we put a huge emphasis on that because it's such a significant contribution that the editor makes. Just even things like, you know, you can, you can take the air out of an interaction. You have to be careful. That's not believable. You know, and really this is one of the superpowers of the editor is to create powerful, not only shape performances, but create um, 
interactions that are believable and compelling and, and having the freedom to do anything. And I just want to say well, my favorite Nick Smith quote was, the good news is you can do anything. The bad news is you can do anything. <laughs> Because it is overwhelming, but yet it's an incredible freedom. So, Obviously, here at the Dolby Podcast, we couldn't end this episode without talking about sound. Here's Pete Doctor and Lee Unkridge from their perspectives. Sound is so emotionally powerful that um, sometimes if you have some lackluster sound or a misleading sound, um, it can be detrimental to your storytelling. But still, I would say like 95% of the sound design we don't really worry about. Uh, even, uh, well, uh, let's see, on Soul, we asked Bren to come up with key defining sound effects and a, a, an approach. Like uh, if you've seen the film, they go to the, the, the great before, that sort of ethereal place. And we were like, oh, come up with some sound because we don't even really know what it's going to look like at this time. Um, so he, Ren came back with some ideas that actually informed the visuals as well, that sort of very spacious, soft kind of feel of the sound ended up showing up in the movie. So, you know, it's definitely a inspirational cycle, um, but by and large, I think all the hard sound effects and kind of uh, less important, emotionally important sound effects, those kind of get put off till the picture locks. You know, editing is all, in my mind, is all about creating an illusion of reality. You know, you're taking all these disparate elements, whether it's live action or animation, you're, you're taking all this um, artifice and you're putting it together, hopefully skillfully in a way so that no one is aware of the artifice. They can have a real experience uh, emotionally or otherwise watching the film. They just get lost in it and believe it. And it seemed to me that it was important to do that in the story reels as well. Um I think I developed a philosophy, a philosophy early on that um, if there was anything in the story reels that took people out of the experience of being engaged in the story, um, I, that I, I felt like I couldn't trust their notes anymore because like, I knew there were things distracting them. I wanted it to be as pure and solid as an experience as possible so that any notes they gave were really just about the storytelling. Um, so I remember in those early days on Toy Story, I, I went through a lot of effort to build rich, um, soundtracks. Now they weren't soundtracks at the level of what Gary Rydstrom would ultimately do, but they did the job. You know, they, they, there was a ceiling, there was kind of a, 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 a bar that I had for myself that I knew I had to meet. I knew that Gary was going to take it way up, uh, above and beyond that. Um, but I took the time I and mean, we, we pulled, sound effects from libraries all the time. I mean, we built our, our sound effects libraries in a huge way after Toy Story. Um, but we also recorded a lot of Foley and other things on our own. Um, I remember one story in particular, there's a scene in Toy Story where Woody is trapped under a milk crate and, um, and he's really despondent. Uh, and, and Buzz is really checked out, right? He, cause he knows he's a toy now and he's depressed and he's unengaged. And Woody, um, picked up a coin in the story reel and he threw it at Buzz to try to kind of knock him into his senses. And when I was cutting that scene, I I went in our machine room and we recorded a, a penny being dropped and I wanted to get to kind of the, the sound of it spinning to a stop. And I cut that into the reel. And I remember when I showed it to Joe and John and Andrew the first time, they immediately had this reaction. Like there was like a, a level of detail as you said, that they, they hadn't seen in, in reels before. Uh, that's just one little example of that. But it was a sound effect that it wasn't just fulfilling the purpose of, of hearing a sound because you see something happening on screen. There was a character to that sound, you know, and the quality, the, like the sound of it slowly coming to a stop somehow served the, um, served the emotion of the scene for me. And so that was a philosophy that I had. And of course, I, you know, it was a thrill for me to get to work with Gary Rydstrom on that movie and subsequent films. And I learned a huge amount from him over time that I was able to bring back um, uh, to the work that I was doing. No discussion of Pixar films would be complete without dissecting the amazing, overwhelming emotional impact that so many of these films have. I wanted to use a very famous sequence from Pete Doctor's film, Up!, as a case study of how editorial influenced that process. So I asked Pete Doctor to walk us through the married life sequence from Up. Up has one of the most 
I, I would say iconic and also emotional uh, sequences in in the Pixar uh, film series, um, and it still it still makes me cry every time I see it. I'm talking about <laughs> uh, Married Life, obviously. I, I would love for you to use that as a little bit of a case study and talk about how you work with your your picture editor, and so maybe you can kind of talk us through how that how that sequence came together and how it evolved. I'm I'm, I'm curious to know, did you you know, did you go down any blind alleys, uh, with that sequence? Did you try some things that didn't work and sort of, how do you, you know, how do you, how do you tack back from that? Well, first of all, the one thing that's kind of not obvious, uh, is that we didn't start out with that sequence in the movie. The, we sort of backed into it. We had the scene of Carl flying his house into the sky with balloons tied to it and off to South America he goes. And people were like, why, does he need to fly his house? It's beautiful. I like the poetry of it, but what, why can't he take the train or an airplane or something, right? Why is he doing this with the house? So we had to work backwards really. Uh, and this took a lot of work is to say, we want to emotionally charge that action and the object of the house so that we, the audience are like, yeah, go fly the house to South America. It's as, as absurd as that is. That's the goal through the whole second act, right? So we really, we knew we needed something really charged to make us connect that action and the house specifically with the rest of the movie. So Bob Peterson, who was writing, came up with the, the sequence was originally a bunch of scenes. So it had, they had dialogue and they were short little crafted bits. And as we crafted that all together, um, it, it was obviously long. I think it was like 20 pages worth of stuff. Then we gave it to Ronnie, uh, who is Ronnie Del Carmen, who's our story, head of story on that film. And he was in his room drawing and he's like, you know, I don't think you need the dialogue here. Uh, we could do this visually. And we looked and said, no, I think you're wrong. I think we need the dialogue. Of course, ultimately, we realized that Ronnie knew what he was talking about. We stripped that out. We stripped out ultimately the sound effects even so that only the music. And of course, at that time, we were using temporary stuff uh, to, to drive it. But it was enough to really engage you emotionally. Um, I had this weird theory that kind of like watching old Super 8 films of your childhood, for those of us at a certain age, you know, that's only picture. There's no sound. And there's something else more uh, impactful, more nostalgic, or, or maybe because you have to be a participant in it. It's not giving you everything. You have to kind of create, what are they talking about there? Or what's what does that sound like and or smell like or whatever? Uh, so I, I feel like it ended up being um, a long road of stripping things away. It's also, you know, hopefully you just watch it and you go, oh, it all kind of tracks as a linear story forward, a forward going story. But if you go back, there's tons of little setups. Like there's no gratuitous shot that's just there because we liked it. It's like, oh, there's a shot of, Carl in the zoo and his cart floats up a little bit. And that's to say, to tell you, Hey, this is a world where houses could fly because uh, that could be absurd in a lot of movies. So we have to kind of set some ground rules in terms of the reality. Every shot in there is either a setup or a payoff to something before it or after it. Um, and of course that is largely the power of editing. Again, you know, it was something that didn't happen. Hopefully the illusion is at the end of the day, you watch these movies and it feels like it just kind of like sprung forward from somebody's brain. But the reality is it's a slow slog <laughs> with lots of revisions. And here's editor Kevin Nolting talking about that same sequence. It took like two years of as the movie changed, that scene changed. And it almost, I mean, I don't remember all the details, but it started off as this punching sequence where Carl was obsessed with Ellie and she was sort of a tomboy and every, every beat in the thing ended with her punching him. And, and it started, and like I said, it was a narrative scene and it slowly evolved into this montage. And then the punching obviously went away and then it became the story of their life. But it really, yeah, it was pretty much a two-year process, I think. I, I think this unique way of handling um, editorial at Pixar probably, I'm sure that it was in part, it came about because it was a new form of computer animation. You guys were all young. You weren't part of the Hollywood establishment. You didn't know what you didn't know necessarily about the way things had always been done. But I'm kind of curious to hear your sense 
now where you are in your position at Pixar and, and as time has gone on. Do you, do you feel like the, the post-production pipeline and methodology and editing, has it kind of evolved to a, a to a, a, a kind of a static point or do you see it continuing to evolve um, in the future? It seems like a lot of things where there was a lot of t turmoil and change at the beginning and now there continues to be change, but in smaller ways. Um, it's interesting, you know, Pixar as a creative community kind of grew out of a mishmash of Disney and the visual effects group because uh, we were literally in the same buildings as ILM. So, you know, watching the way boards were being used for live action films uh, affected the way we were doing stuff as well. So, you you know, um, it, it's a cool blend of mediums of live action and hand-drawn film and uh, all this stuff. So, yeah, I think now today, let's see, I mean, we continue to experiment with different things. Um, there have been uh, different ways, like more recently, well, this was, I guess, as far back as Brave, which was what, like our, 12th film or something like that. And um, they realized, you know, just to back up again, we're boarding, putting together sequences. And typically there's like 23 to 30 sequences that all come together into a feature, right? So it's a lot of work. You're putting together each one of these little three to seven minute chunks. And then ultimately it's coming together in 90 minutes worth of stuff they realized, you know, this scene here in the middle, I don't remember what it was. Maybe we don't need to really board that. We could just indicate it with a still drawing and maybe some narration or a subtitle that tells us what happened. So we came up with this idea of story booking. Um, uh, and so that happens now. And people have tried different things of like putting in radio shows for se certain sections. And, you know, there's always experimentation. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't often depending on the people involved as well as the execution of it. Um, so it's, you know, movies are, there's no rules, right? I mean, all they have to do is move you emotionally at the end, how you get there. There's thousands of different ways to do that. Well, you know, it's really interesting because right now I think that the temptation is to compartmentalize it as something very different than live action editing. But when you look at what's going on with live action and editing now, um, it's filled with effects and animation. So those lines continue to blur and they will blur further and delineating them will become more and more difficult. It's like, okay, so is Lord of the Rings, is that live action or is it sort of a hybrid? And I think there'll be more and more hybrid situations where you'll have to use all of your tools, all of your animation knowledge and all of your live action knowledge and, and bring it together. Um, I think that it's just going to become much more unified um, and it's not going to be thought as of as a completely distinct separate uh, uh, discipline than live action editing. All films now are animated. Okay. With these digital tools, these techniques are really applicable to everything. You know, let's face it, a Marvel film is an animated film, okay? Um, the so-called live action version of The Lion King, I hate to tell you, is an animated film. So, uh, and, and let's look at all these really interested thing, interesting things that are happening with volumes, you know, these LED uh, production stages. This is basically bringing these techniques, collapsing this process, uh, this pipeline, if you will, into something like a circle, like we talked about. And if you have the editor on the set of these volumes, uh, you can see right away uh, what you're getting and what can happen and what you need. And so I think that, you know, what's really interesting is, yes, something definitely happened to animation back in the day at Pixar. And we talk about the role of the editor and all that. But the, the, the strand that's going to keep going after Pixar keeps breaking ground is the editor, you know, the, the idea that building scenes uh, from shots, how, whatever the method is, is going to belong to the editor and the editor will be in the center of these processes. I don't know that it's evolving. I mean, it's evolving in terms of it's evolving in terms of um, just the fact that each story, each film will have its own unique challenges. Um, and, and of course, every editor is going to have their own taste 
and their own methodology for how they approach their work. Um, but I think if you were to step back from it all, we're all kind of doing the same thing at this point. Um, and, and that's fine. Like there's no need to reinvent the wheel just for the sake of reinventing the wheel. Will there be other technologies that come along? Yeah, probably, maybe, I don't know. Um, I mean, these are all just tools we're talking about, right? In terms of the, you know, what editing system you're on or what sound editing software you're using. These are just tools in service of storytelling. Storytelling hasn't changed over the course of making movies all that much. Um, and we just now have tools that have slowly over time reduced the amount of friction between uh, somebody's vision and actually getting something up on uh, in the theater for an audience. That's really what it's all about in my mind. I felt like it was appropriate to give Lee Unkridge the last word here, since his work at Pixar was so instrumental in crafting the unique role that editors play when working on a Pixar film. And I hope this gives you a new perspective and a new appreciation of that role and that work as well. I want to thank Pete Doctor, Lee Unkrich, Kevin Nolting, and Edie Ichioka for speaking with us today on this fascinating subject. And of course, many thanks to Bill Kender and Bobby Osteen, the authors of the book Making the Cut at Pixar, The Art of Editing Animation. We will have a link in the show notes so you can order that book for yourself. It's a great read with some excellent ancillary materials such as video clips of the interviews they conducted and example clips of early drafts of Pixar animation. And a special thanks to our friends over at Pixar who put together a lot of these interviews for us. And if you're interested in watching or more likely re-watching some of these excellent Pixar films, you can find them streaming on Disney Plus, often in Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos. We'd like to thank our friends at Disney and Pixar for helping us bring this episode to you. But before we go, if you enjoyed this episode, make sure you're subscribed to us, the Dolby Institute podcast. You can find links to our show on all the major podcasting platforms in our show notes, or you can simply search for Dolby wherever you get your podcasts. Until then, thanks again for joining us. Sound and Image Lab is brought to you by the Dolby Institute. I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry with production support by Taylor Hines. And our production coordinator is Sonny Chen. Thank you for listening.